my brain for so many years told me, uh, you know, to give up was to, to lose, to give up was to fail, to give up was to die, uh, to fight was to like throw in the towel, right? And then I, I come into sobriety and it tells me all the exact opposite. To fight yeah. is to die, to fight is to lose. To fight is to relapse. So it's a complete mind fuck. So understanding that everything that this telling this tells me is generally a lie. And, 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 and the sooner that I was able to understand that, then I could start to understand the gravity and severity of the alcoholism or addiction I was up against. What it is, Brad Lee back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs. Folks, today, as always, I got a real treat for you. Brandon Novak in the house. What's happening, buddy? Yeah, I appreciate the love, man. I appreciate you coming in. And folks, if you guys don't know who this is, pro skateboarder, MTV celebrity, co-star of like Jackass series, all the Bam Margeras and shit like that that were, that were going on back in the day. How long ago was that? My life was a blur for a lot of years, but I remember one of the premieres for Jackass was 11, 11, 11. Oh, really? Yeah. Who was that? Uh, uh, Johnny Knoxville's idea. Whose idea was Jackass? Um, well, it came uh, from a few different people. It, it was, you know, Bam kind of had the, the CKY era. Um, Jeff Tremaine was with Big Brother which was a skate magazine and the West Coast band was the East Coast. And those two kind of came together and then created uh, the the series, this TV series, which then transcended into the movies. And were you just one of the buddies that was happened to be around and next thing you know, you're on the freaking big screen? Um, kind of. So skateboarding is the glue that holds us mostly all together. You were all skateboarders. Yeah. And... Um, Bam and I grew up together skateboarding. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, originally. And Is that where he's from? No, he's from Westchester, Pennsylvania. Okay. Right next to each other. They butt up, too. And um, I was uh, skating with this guy named Bucky Lasik, who's another professional skateboarder out of Baltimore. Legendary man. And um, every weekend, we'd go to this skate park in, in Westchester, Cheap Skates, in Pennsylvania. And and I had met Bam there and and. Bam and I, we, we looked alike, we talked alike, we skated alike, dressed alike, and we were really outside the box kind of contest skaters and really were into transitioning. Every year, we would practice for this contest uh, at Bricktown Skate Park in New Jersey, the NSAs, and, and either he would win or I would win. And, and one year, I didn't show up, but my my mentor, Bucky, did, and, and Bam went to Bucky. He said, yo, where's Novak? And, and Bucky said, I think he's on heroin. And, and Bucky's like, and Bam was like, what? He had never even heard of the word at such a young age. And How old were you? I was, um, at that point, 16. And his career continued to excel. And he became a household name and, you know, made his first million and, and just grew from there. And, and, and I, I chose to pursue the career of heroin and my, my life completely, uh, declined and I became like this homeless heroin addict in Baltimore. And then one year, Bam was on tour with a team that he rode for and they went to a skate shop in Baltimore and they were doing a demo and, and Bam happened to ask the guy who owned the skate shop, do you ever see Novak? And, and he said, not much. Because at that time, I, I really viewed skateboarding as like the love that got away. You know what I mean? Like I, I had this promising career that literally I, I could have been the happiest man ever with and and I chose to to give that away to my addiction so I really avoided it at all costs but I would occasionally show up at the skate shop when um when I couldn't get money and times were really tough and I hoped they'd take mercy on me and on this particular day I stopped in and they they had told Bam they said no he, he we rarely see him but ironically enough two days later I happened to stop in there and I said, hey, can I get some money? And they said, we're not going to give you money. But Bam was here a couple of days ago and he left his phone number and said, if you want to get clean and get off heroin to call him. About a week later, I, I went to the 7-Eleven and I put 50 cents into the pay phone. And, and I was like holding on to that phone with dear life because I knew if I, the machine picked up, I'd lose the 50 cents. Like times were that tough. And, um, and ironically enough, he answered. And, and I was on a Greyhound bus that night from Baltimore to Westchester. And, and at that time he had had Viva La Bam, the TV show 
on in, in a crazy budget and an insanely successful household name, right guard commercial, um, Wheaties box. And, and, uh, he afforded me the opportunity to, to like kick my habit and, and continue to skate again and, and put me on his TV show. And, and, um, you know, I had a rule. I, I couldn't do heroin or, or pills, but like Coke and alcohol was okay. Cause it was kind of a socially acceptable thing. That's funny. You know. Now knowing what you know now, that's funny. Totally. Yeah. Like, Hey, you know, he, he didn't understand the deal. Of course you know, not. Who was? Sounds like he was just trying to be a buddy. Legit. And, um, but didn't, didn't he fuck up eventually? Yeah. You know, it, as, as time progressed, he kind of found himself in a position battling his own demons. And, uh, I wonder what causes this. Cause again, I mean, he was a household name for a long time and you know, now like I, I don't, you know, pay attention, but like when I do hear or see of him, yeah, it's not good. Yeah. 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 It's him slurring or, you know, he's wanted by the police or he's out on the lamb. Like there's nothing good about it. So what happened to him? Same thing that happened to you. Um, yeah, he's definitely had his trials and tribulations, but to shed light on a dark subject right now, I believe he has like, uh, four or so months sober. And I think he's really okay. doing well. So that's hats awesome. off to him, but that's the really, well, that's what I was wondering because, because you now are helping people, even if they don't have money, kick the habit, get clean, yeah. get sober. Yeah. Yeah. You've opened up. Uh, yeah, I've opened up. So, so I went to treatment ultimately, you know, after a, a 22 year run with addiction and alcoholism, wow. uh, ended up going to 13 inpatient treatment centers. My, my mother had bought me a plot, um, People had taken life insurance policies out on me. Uh, at the end of my alcoholism, my mother would get on her knees and she would pray to God to either uh, cure me or kill me because she could no longer take it anymore. Were you stealing money from her? Everything. You know, I was the kind of alcoholic and addict that like, if you told me you loved me, I had you for at least 10 bucks. You know, I, I wasn't the kind of guy that was cut from that cloth that I'd steal from strangers because like, I would get some retribution from that. So I, I, unfortunately, as most addicts do, I, I would hurt the ones that love me the most. And uh, it got to a point at the end where she literally, uh, at 38 years old, I was walking into my 13th inpatient treatment center, May 25th, 2015. And May 23rd, 2015, I, I came to after being on life support for seven days at, at Mercy Hospital, the very same hospital that she's a uh, nuclear physicist at, on the board of, very successful woman. And, um, your mother. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our, our family reunion would kind of look like me being brought into the hospital in an ambulance and, 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 and hit with Narcan overdose as per usual. And, and I'd be in the emergency room and, and someone would recognize my last name and, and they'd call up to the third floor, which is the nuclear medicine department that she ran. And, and they'd say, Pat, you, your boy's back. He's back. He's back. He, and it was, it was such a wash, rinse, repeat to at the end. You know, I was a 38 year old homeless heroin addict that just wanted to kill himself on a daily basis. And I was like terrified to hurt myself in the process. Come from a really good family. My brother's insanely intelligent. He's, a, he's an attorney who works in the White House, <laughs> who does pensions and benefits. Mm. My father was a, he was around just enough to let us know he wasn't around. He never held a job a day in his life. He taught me one thing. If and when I went to prison, how to conduct myself. And, and he ran with the Hells Angels. He was one of those kind of fellows, but he acquired the liking of crack cocaine and, and his body shut down and, and he's no longer with us. So I knew right from wrong at a very young age, right? Like I could, I could, because everyone loved Jerome, which was my father. Everyone loved Jerome except for his family. And, uh, when he didn't come home to make dinner at five thirty, we knew what we were in for when we heard him and his biker buddies pulling at three and the key hit the lock. And we shook like leaves because we were going to endure some things that, that no child should ever endure. So at a very young age, I could understand the psychic change that takes place of, in an individual upon ingesting a drink or a drug, right? Like the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde scenario. I could see it clear as day. And at 38 years old, ultimately, uh, walking into my 13th inpatient treatment center, despite being a, a pretty successful individual by, by some standards, uh, everything I owned consisted of eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, a stick of deodorant. Uh, it fit into this bag that doubled as my pillow, uh, a needle, a spoon, and a restraining order that my mother had served on me. Um, everyone felt that it was best to love me from a distance. And uh, 
That's kind of what they're told. Yeah. I mean, you get educated to that from, from, you know, anybody in programs, you know, gotta be tough love. Yeah. Creating boundaries. Do you you agree with that approach? That's the difficulty of this dilemma that we find ourselves in with addiction, right? It's, it's, it's not a one size fits all black and white instruction manual. You read this, you get this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm married to my narrative because it worked for me. And, and, and for me, what had to happen was repercussions from my actions, right? People had to allow me to have my process. And, and looking back, everything that I know today is, is all just in, in retrospect. You know, life is, for me, live forward and learn backwards. And, and I can look back and see that if anyone would have robbed me of my process, not created those boundaries and, and saved me from the harsh outcome that I allow my addiction to create for me, I, I wouldn't be the, 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 the man or child of God that I am today who's literally devoted his life to helping people who are where I once was. Because I'm a product of that environment. I believe in it, you know, and I know that it's possible. I always wonder, like, if you say 12 times, I always think to myself, well, why, why this time's any different? Because, I mean, you did it 12 times. Why is this one the one you're going to, this going to stick? It's funny you say that. Um, Bam asked that same question to me after my last treatment center. He said, why, why 13? Why? And truth be told, very accurate question. Why? Because the reality is treatment center number 13 didn't tell me anything different the 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, or 1, it missed. I, I'm a big fan and believer in, in timing and alignment. And, and I think the, well, I know that the appropriate amount of pain was created for me to do the unthinkable, which was uh, reach that phone up that felt like a million pounds and not only ask for help, but be willing to accept it and then open-minded enough to follow through with the suggestions that you gave me. Because clearly, you know, after attempting to get sober so many times, I got to a point in my life where I could no longer like deny, minimize or or justify the severity of my addiction. Right. It was very easy for me to see that I had basically for the better part of 18 years simply rearranged the furniture on the Titanic. Um, and my ship sank every goddamn time. And, and that I, Brandon Novak, was the common denominator in my problems, right? Like I can no longer blame it on the, 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 the f- fiance because she's now the ex, right? I can't blame it on the one before her because she's also the ex. I can't blame it on the father because he's dead. Or you could, you'd just be doing the wrong thing. Yeah. And then I'm just basically like shooting heroin at you. <laughs> did you, did you have anyone to like walk you through these like enlightened beliefs? For sure. For sure. So again, you know, the reason why 13 took is for the first time, I, you know, I, I was able to look back and, and see the synchronicity in life's events that have led me to the here and now. And, and I was aware of them and, and, uh, you know, what I saw is that, like, if I just, like, you know, I, I couldn't understand how I got beat so bad every time by addiction. I'm a really intelligent guy. Pride myself on being an outside-the-box thinker. I'm the kind of guy that if I can believe it, I can see it, not the other way around. Have no problem getting things. Really tough time keeping things prior to my sobriety. Um, but I could, like, and I'm not, like, when I say beat, I mean pulverized, bloody by my opponent, meaning addiction. Not like a fat lip or a, a swollen elbow. I'm talking like teeth yanked out, eyes cut out, uh, ears sliced off, you know, skinned alive kind of beating I would get every time I stepped in the ring. And I couldn't understand why. Like, and looking back, it's clear as day is simply because I never gave it the, the time, attention, or respect that my disease deserved. Because as an addict or an alcoholic, I... You know, I, I, all that means is that I'm defiant by nature. I hate authority and I refuse to conform because I possess. Well, this. That's me. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a lot of us, you know? So people get really caught up with like, oh yeah, but I'm not a drug addict. I'm not an alcoholic. We, we all have a sickness and it's just exposed in different ways. Some porn, some shopping, some sex, some food, gambling, drugs, alcohol. I wish I had one. Yeah, God bless you. <laughs> like sometimes my ambition is to be an alcoholic. I'd love to be like my dad was. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, he, it seems like he had fun, dude. He'd get off work, he'd go to the bar, and he'd come home, and, you know, sometimes he was pissed and, you know, not the nicest guy, and then sometimes he was happy. But at the end of the day, it seemed like he had a lot of fun. For sure. You might. And, and, I, and I drank, but I'm just never... <clears throat> I'm not a, an addict. Yeah. So, so I, I, and again, I'm not saying that I wish I was because obviously I'm glad I'm not because that never ends well. Yeah. Like I'm old enough to tell anyone listening and I don't need to have been there to say this. It's not going to end well. Mm -hmm. Like I've never seen anybody successfully be an addict. No. Ever. It's always going to crash. Now, it might seem like they're having fun because mm -hmm. it seemed like my dad was having fun. And I had a buddy of mine that was freaking uh, smoking basically crack. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I smoked crack once for three days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. But, 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 you know, at some point in time, dude, I like, oh, shit, I can't do this. Like, this is heavy duty. Like, and that's, that's what the separates you from I. But that's the closest I got to where, like, dude, I couldn't help it. And there were, for three days, I really couldn't help it. Sure. But at some point, my, like, common fucking sense says, dude, this is not the good way to go. And so I bailed. Totally. And never touched it again, obviously. Thank God, because mm -hmm. that shit. Have you ever smoked crack? Oh, yeah, have you ever yeah. smoked? I, you know, I was even though I was a full blown heroin addict, I loved to shoot speedballs, heroin and cocaine. So but I never crack, did that. <laughs> but but, well, that but crack, when someone would offer me a hit, I, I'd be like, well, I knew better than to get caught up with that because I could come up with like ten bucks every couple, you know, every six hours, but like ten bucks every five minutes for a blast is a lot. Yeah, well, that's a tough, and one. it gets you. Yeah, I I was like scared of that. Believe I thought it or not. I thought people <laughs> say heroin is ten times, you know, more powerful. No, well, it just depends on what your deal is. Some people like to go uptown. Some people like to go downtown. Um, what does crack, that mean? Like some people like uh, you know speed, meth, coke. Is that right? uptown or downtown? Uppers, yeah. You know, some people like me like is heroin downtown. Yeah, downers. You know, like I said, I think opiates. one of the reasons just heroin sounds scary. It always has. I've never done it, never smoked it, never tried it. I don't shoot anything. Mm -hmm. I've never shot anything. Um, but I think back in my past, there was a kid named Jason and we'd go to his house after school and his mom was doing heroin on her couch and she would nod and then puke. Mm hmm. And I always wondered, like, why would anybody want to do that? What's the appeal? Yeah. Sure. So I think maybe that exposure, you know, maybe I never went past a certain, you know, way. But to me, when I talk to guys like you, I think to myself, where were you and what caused you to be willing to fucking do all this shit? Because you had to have known it. I mean, you didn't like no one snuck it to you. You, you knew totally. what was up. How did you like want to do this shit? So I think for me, uh, I was genetically predisposed. My father was an addict. His father was an addict. My brother and sister and or who by are from a different man and they have no issue. You know, so I believe that was my deal. And, and my father, you know, he, my mother got her first job drawing blood for $5 a pop, a phlebotomist, if you will, and, and worked her way up the ladder to become a pretty big deal at that hospital. But in doing so, she was really consumed with that, that, that goal. So there were days that she wished weren't the case that she'd have to leave me with my father. And he would uh, put me in the car and, and I'd drive around with him while he would go to the strip joint and, and he'd be in the back conducting business. And uh, he'd sit me at the, the bar and, and the pretty dancing girls would, would put me belly up to the bar and, and pour shots of ginger ale and Coca-Cola into a shot glass. And I would do that and, and they would applaud. My father would give me that look of approval, and, and, you know, riding around watching him getting high. And so I was kind of like, you know, was molded into that. Your brother and sister, that didn't happen with? No, just me. I, I was the only one by my father. Uh, um, but yeah, it's, uh, and then for me, that party that you were just talking about, that was really fun. I had some of the best times in my life getting loaded that I would never take back and I'd go do it again by far. Um, but the truth of my story is that, uh, it, it went from this amazing, great time doing things that some couldn't even imagine are happening to this like 
full blown hostage negotiation where I was no longer uh, allowed to leave. You know, the party had ended a long time ago for me. And, and that's the thing as an addict or an alcoholic, you smoke crack for three days and you, you have that moment of clarity, that reality of like, Whoa, this isn't, this isn't going to lead to a great outcome. I should get back to reality. Me, once I ingest that first, I have the choice over my first. And, and after that, I, I lose the privilege to have a say so of what I will or will not do. Um, and any casualty in between me and getting that next one, because anybody, anybody, any person, any place, anything that attempts to stand between me and a drink or a drug, once I'm caught up in active addiction, must and will go. But it's never personal. It's just business because I'm a good fucking guy. And I, and I really mean well. What do you what do you think was the stronger addiction, alcohol or drugs? Um, for me, it was just all I cared about was drugs. Um, it, it it it's just kind of like a dog or a cat deal. Hmm. You know, ask an alcoholic, they'll say alcohol. Ask a heroin addict, they'll say heroin. Yeah, see, I used to get like you know drunk when I drank, I drank, and I'd get drunk and I'd do stupid shit just like an alcoholic would. Mm-hmm. But the next day I'd get up and feel like shit and not drink. Well, that, you know, so I've never been addicted to alcohol, uh, but I've been done some dumb shit Mm -hmm. with alcohol for a long time. And then, and then again, I think it was one night that I can think of. If you say, do you drink? I don't say no because I will and can, I suppose, but I haven't. And I don't because if I'm going to drink, I want to get drunk. In other words, I'm not here to taste a, a, yeah. a cocktail. I don't like the flavor of it. It's not that good. It's to get buzzed. Yeah. So it's like, hey, someone's celebrating something. They want to get a little buzz, do a couple shots of uh, a tequila. I'll be happy to. I just never do. Yeah. So I'm I'm not a non-drinker, but I don't drink, if that makes sense. That and, makes the, and the day sense. I quit, I got hammered uh, on wine and embarrassed myself and my wife and my friends and woke up and... My wife was embarrassed for probably the 90th Oof. time. And I said, honey, I'm not going to drink anymore. And she said, yeah, right. And I said, what, you think I can't stop drinking? She said, I don't think so. Mm. Just stopped. And again, it's cause it wasn't because I'm so powerful. Yeah. It's because I wasn't addicted in the first place. Sure. I didn't need to drink. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I smoke cigars right now. I don't need a cigar. Totally. I can Take go the rest it. of my life with no cigar. Mm-hmm. But guess what? soon as you leave, I'm going to go puff a cigar. Why? Sure. I don't see the harm in it, but I'm not addicted. Yeah, yeah. I was addicted to cigarettes. That was a hard one. Yeah, that was a tough one. Same. Um, but I did coke, acid, mushrooms, meth, and ecstasy, I think. Mm-hmm. And never got addicted to those. And I did an ample amount. What? Why do you think some people can and some people can't? You think it's genetic? For me, it, it is. It was. Well, then how come your brothers and sisters, they're not from the same dad? Exactly. Ah. Yeah, different bloodline. So you believe that someone could be sitting out there with the genetic makeup to be an addict but not be one? Or if you have the genetic makeup, you're going to be one. You just haven't got one yet. I, I wish I, if I could answer that question, I'd be a really wealthy man. You know, I'd be able to cure this epidemic that we're in. And uh, we are. And I, it's one out of three people will be affected. Have you seen directly the movie, or indirectly? Uh, uh, what's that movie where the opioid uh, epidemic? Mm-hmm. And you know what's crazy is I have a half brother. He died from opioids. Mm-hmm. He was an addict. Mm-hmm. Like I would help, 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 and that dipshit would just continue to to do drugs. Yeah, and he didn't want any help. Mm-hmm. You tried to help him. If you didn't give money, and that then you ain't out to help him. So anyway, eventually, obviously, you stop giving him money, and sure enough, guess what? They're gonna find money one way or the other, and he did. And then one day they called me and said he was dead, and I said, "From what?" And they said, "Overdose on what's the pill? Fentanyl? The, no, is the new thing oxycodone? Yeah, thirty yeah. oxycontin or ox- oxycodone, oxycodones, something. yeah." That oxy drug that, mm-hmm. was, you know, I, and I didn't even that realize I until I watched the movie. this epidemic with heroin today. I truly believe that. Really? Absolutely. And that, and see, again, they're still in business. Uh-huh. How is it possible? It's these- so financially incentivized. It, it, it goes so deep and it's so broad. Uh, it's, 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 
It's disgusting. So, so I work with the DEA, right? Which may sound insane. The DEA came to me and they, they said to me, they said, look, Mr. Novak, we understand that we can no longer arrest our way out of this problem. Right. They said we were interviewing Pablo Escobar <clears throat> and we said to Pablo, Hey Pablo, how do we stop the, uh, the supply? And Pablo looked at us, and this is words from them verbatim. They said, Pablo looked at us, didn't blink an eye, and he said, you stop the supply by stopping the demand. And then they said, we understand that we can't arrest our way out of this problem. So we want to see if you'd be willing to be the keynote speaker for this, uh, this function that we throw, and it's called the opioid summit, the, the 360-degree opioid summit that the DEA throws in. The DEA is kind of like the... Uh, they're like uh, the the they're like the the VA, right? It's 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 under one big umbrella, but they're all different factions throughout the states, and and the DEA works the same way. So they brought me on to to be this keynote speaker because they believe that you know if I can instill inspire in one person. Um, that is like me, right? Defiant by nature, hates authority, refuses to conform because he possesses his job and consists of knowing everything. Well, what I do is I deliver my message in a form of attraction rather than promotion. I always say I, I deliver it in a way that I, I hope you could find so appealing, so desirable, um, and, and so, so memorable that you like want to fuck it. Right, like if I can get you to want what I have so bad that you're willing to do anything it takes um, to acquire it, then the terms of your contract will forever change. But it has to be our idea, mm -hmm. right? So, so I, I <coughs> deliver my message, and my hope is that when I'm done talking, if one person says like, if he can do it, there's no reason why I can't. And that was the case for me. And, and it came by way of, you asked earlier if I had any mentors in my life. And one of them is a fellow by the name of Chris Herring. He played for the, the Denver Nuggets and the Boston Celtics, a legendary basketball player who had a very similar story to mine. Um, and now today we do the same thing. Mm. And uh, although I didn't believe in me, I was in detox this last time and I was so disconnected from reality and, and humanity that it had been a long time since I cried or felt any kind of emotion. And they played his, de his, his video on the detox and, and a part of the video, his therapist calls him in the office and he says, hey, Mr. Basketball, come on in. And he, he comes in and he said, take this phone, do me a favor. And, and Chris said, yeah, what's that? And he said, I want you to call your wife and do the best thing you could ever do for your family. He said, what's that? He said, I want you to tell your wife to tell your children that you've died in a car accident because you'll do nothing but destroy and hurt them for the rest of your life as long as you continue to die. And I could relate to that, right? That was like the level of life I was living. Um, the abnormal become the normal. I'm, I'm living on this animalistic level where I merely live to use and use to live. And, and again, although I didn't believe in me, I believed in what he was saying and the story that he was telling and the outcome that he had created for himself as a direct result of sobriety. So I fucking bought in. And through buying into him and believing in him, ultimately it came back for me to believe in me. And, um, and, and, and that one person that helped me then allowed me to go help another right? Two help four, four help eight, eight help 16. Before you know it, we're, we're changing the narrative. And in changing the narrative, we're, we're creating a different outcome. I alone spent the majority of 19 years coming up with as much money as humanly possible to inject into my arm. Day to night, when my eyes open to close, just me stopping that demand has created a shift in the supply alone. So imagine, you know, that's how we change the world, I believe, by fucking giving our attention to one individual at a time. People are so quick to want to find the solution to create billions of dollars in assets and, 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 and be the man overnight. No, it goes back to those fucking sayings and slogans. Rome wasn't built in the day, man. So these centers that you have now, How'd you start doing those? Hey, you want to spend an hour a week with me helping you become a business badass? Well, check out my group in the link below. So I dumbed my way into anything successful that I have today, right? And as anything good in my life happens, generally it's unbeknownst to me. So when I bought into the process of sobriety and recovery, I, 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 I 
acquired a mentor who was a sponsor who really saw in me what I didn't see in myself. And, and he was allowing me the ability of, of, of choice and freedom, but to get me where he believed that I wanted to be. Right. It was just a happy guy who, who, who felt the need to, to be excited about waking up every morning. Not like the Joneses of like how far behind you are. You need to catch up with a wife and a house and a picket fence and kids. Like, let's just focus on you, you as an individual, as a human being. And, and let's start internally. Right. So, so he, he took me through the 12 steps of, of my fellowship that I attend and and I always say that the God of my understanding brought me to AA and AA via the 12 steps brought me back to the God of my understanding. And throughout working those 12 steps, I had a spiritual experience. Mm. The definition of a spiritual experience is simply a psychic change. So I, Brandon Novak, today no longer think how I thought when I was sitting in a facility holding on to a chair in an AA meeting for dear life because I was in fear for my life because I didn't believe I could make it through another day sober. Now I'm a fucking free man that can go anywhere with anybody, anytime I like. I lived in a sober living house for one year. I went to an inpatient treatment center for 90 days. From there, I went to a sober living house for a year, followed the suggestions of my mentor, my sponsor. He had done it, and at the time, he had 13 years sober. I wasn't trying to recreate the wheel or, or, or solve world hunger, just trying to make it through another day. Followed his suggestions, and... Uh, and that home did for me what I could never do for myself. It, it, it taught me how to reintegrate or merge back into society. It taught me how to do laundry. It taught me how to make my bed every day. It, it taught me how to, to get my own way to work. And, and at this time, my, my get well job was washing dishes at a, at a diner called Marianne's Diner for $6 an hour under the table. And uh, at 38 years old, and despite my brain telling me that I should have been at the very least the president of the United States, right? Not fucking washing dishes in this diner. I believed in the process and, and I had good people that told me it's, it's only temporary. And, uh, nonetheless, I continued to follow through. I showed up early. I washed dishes with like integrity. I did the best that I could one dish at a time. I started to like, um, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection. And, and the, the, the core of my disease is that I'm selfish and I'm self-centered. So it's me, 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 me. And if I have two minutes to spare you, but only if it's going to benefit me. Hence me continuing to stay in my alcoholism and addiction. But then I get this job and I, the job that I thought was so meaningless. And I believed I was so much above and, and further along in life. Despite being in these movies and this, this skateboarder and this author who's wildly successful and sold hundreds of thousands of copies and little did I know this job was going to teach me the fundamentals of life it, it taught me how to mean what I say how to say what I mean how to show up um, be a man of action and and I didn't miss one day of washing dishes there were days I wanted to call out but I was like if I call out who will who will who will help Brian with the rest of the dishes I started to take other people's feelings into consideration and, and through working that job, I, I was able to open uh, my own bank account for the first time. Usually I had a woman attached to it, right? Because I could get things. I couldn't keep them, and they could keep things afloat. Um, and I opened my first uh, checking account. Uh, I, I got a pre-secured credit card. I started paying my own rent, one sixty-five a week at that sober living house. Then I started paying it bi-weekly, buying my own cigarettes. I smoked at the time, groceries. And, and although I, I had no self-esteem, I was doing these esteemable acts. Right? And, and through doing these esteemable acts, unbeknownst to me one day, I gained some self-esteem and I held my head up a little bit higher and I spoke with a little bit more conviction and I believed what I was saying to you and I wasn't in fear of what you thought of me. Nonetheless, I continued on that process. I stayed at that job for one year and, and uh, one day I was contacted by a facility that was located in Florida and they said, hey, we, we've seen on social media that you've gotten sober and you've been speaking at these different places. Would you like to come speak for our facility? I said, sure. They said, when? I said, well, if it were up to me yesterday, because in between this time uh, that we've been talking, four people have died as a direct result of an overdose. Like, I'm passionate about this cause. I believe it. I love drugs and alcohol, so what better place to, to work around? And... Um, and so they brought me to that program and they toured me with all the houses, all the levels of care. And in my mind, I'm thinking they're about to ask me for a donation, right? I think they think I'm the old guy that was like pretty on top, 
but meanwhile I'm living in this sober living house washing dishes for six bucks an hour. At the end of the three days, um, they said, hey, Novak, we didn't fly you here for anything. We'd like for you to work for us and to be the face of this organization. And I had no idea this work can, existed. And, and they said, we'd like you to do what Chris Herring does for the other place, the guy who, who inspired me to believe in me and, and all the synchronicity, it's all aligning. And so I started doing that. And, and on my fifth year sober anniversary, I had the ability to recreate the very same sober living house that I lived in that did for me what no other place could do. And I opened up my very first Novak's house, one house with 10 beds in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, Why there? Things aligned. I'm from Baltimore. I live in Philadelphia. My mother, the woman who never gave up on me, who loved me in spite of myself, she she fed me when I didn't feed myself. She uh, she prayed for me when I didn't pray for myself. I believe the power of prayer is what landed me where I'm at today. And uh, although she served me with a restraining order at the end, she 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 took life support. She 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 took life insurances out on me. Um, she prayed for my death. Uh, today she's my best friend and and I always say be careful what you ask for because if you stay sober you'll get it and she's 83 and she's reverted back to like childlike behaviors and she doesn't like to shower and and uh there's days I have to drive to Baltimore to like make sure she gets a shower um she doesn't like to brush her teeth much anymore she eats like shit <laughs> she's like a kid I love it but uh I had to take her to the dentist a couple months ago I take her to the dentist they have to pull eight teeth, right? Mm. And uh, and then I put her in my Range Rover and I drive across the street to the grocery store. I don't smoke. She smokes. I go in to get her prescriptions filled, her drugs filled, right? All her narcotics because her mouth's all swollen. I come out, I swear to God. She's in the passenger seat of my Range Rover, which is pretty clean and new and kept tight. And, and she's got these galls hanging out of her mouth, blood coming out, knotted out with a cigarette hanging out of her mouth. <laughs> In the car? If that wasn't a full circle moment, you know, that was, that's like, then that's Payback. me making my living amends and I wouldn't have it any other way. So, awesome. I, so, so, so she's in Baltimore. I live in Philly. My facilities are in Wilmington, which is halfway through. I ended up in Wilmington because I have a financial advisor who's in Wilmington. The only place that really resides in, in Delaware are, are, are weird tax, you know, incorporations for tax purposes. So, so that's the first Novak's house. Yeah. So the first one house, 10 beds. And today we've been blessed with six houses uh, and 65 beds. Um, we charge $180 a week rent, but my, my mission is to never let price be a deterrent as to why someone can't follow through with the continuum of care after they complete an inpatient program. Yeah. So if I have a bed available and you're a man, because I only have men's houses and are willing to follow the guidelines, um, I'll provide you a scholarship. I'll give you a bed. Wow. Um, but the goal is, and it generally works is that you stay the minimum of a year because that's what I did. Right. I'm not recreating anything here. I'm just doing what I did. And, and usually you can come off that scholarship and around a month in will help you find a job and become self-sufficient so you can pay your own way. Those esteemable acts, like I shared with you, that teach us how to have some self-esteem. And uh, unfortunately, it's working really well. But there's such a need. Why unfortunately? Because I wish that our services weren't needed. I wish that there was no such thing as Novak's house. I wish that, that people weren't begging for beds. I wish that the addiction isn't as alarming and, and detrimental as it is, but there is. So I've learned through my sobriety that I can create any <clears throat> environment that I seek. There's nothing that I can't do. Do you think, um, do you think you have ever experienced someone faking addiction for a bed? No, no. Because what I've learned. Cause if I'm out on the road or, or broke, you know, and I'm hungry and I'm tired and I'm like, I'm not a druggie, but damn dog, you got a bed for 160 a week. For sure. Like, for let sure. me get that. Yeah, no doubt. So I got to go fake being a, being an addict. So you'll allow me the bed. I'm not saying it wouldn't happen. Uh, we we're a bit too, too keen on that kind of behavior. So you'll know yeah. an addict. When because, you see so we were talking earlier about, you know, we all have this sickness you know, whatever it may be. Um, 
But really, the drugs and the alcohol, here's the life hack. For anybody out there suffering with any kind of ailment, sex, porn, drugs, alcohol, none of those things are the problem. The drugs, the alcohol, the porn, the, the money, the sex, that's not the problem at all. We're focused on the wrong thing, thinking that that is the problem. It's, it's actually quite the contrary. It's the solution to the problem. It's the answer. It's not the problem. It's the answer to the problem. What is the problem? The thinking, the attitude, and the behavior. So if I just simply sit this thing down and walk away, it's not a matter of if, but when I return back to pick it back up. Because the same addict, the same alcoholic, the same sex addict, the same porn addict, the same food addict will always use again if they don't work on the problem, which is the thinking, the attitude, and the behavior, which is why it's continuously a wash, rinse, repeat kind of cycle. You know? That's a bomb, my man. I'll take it. That's right. I, I do the same thing with entrepreneurs. Dude. It's always usually in their head first. Every, and this is the thing. It, it defies logic to think that I can use the very same brain that thought me into this problematic outcome to in turn think that I can think myself out of it. So I always say this thing works when I don't work it. When I take me out of the equation, surround myself with like sincere, like-minded people who genuinely have my fucking best interest at heart, not how, financial here. But how can you identify those? Um, by just, you know, it's kind of like you get one, you get one mentor and then that mentor puts you on with other mentors and then see what happened is I acquired this knowledge. Ignorance is no longer bliss. I'm no longer just aimlessly rolling through life trying to figure shit out. Now I'm armed with the facts and, uh, and realize ultimately the longer I stay sober, the more I know that I don't fucking know. And this is really uh, nothing done by me. It's, it's, I'm, all, I'm on the spiritual journey. Therefore, it's like, uh, where's my spirituality if I judge your spirituality? Acceptance is the answer to everything in my program. So I believe that everyone's exactly where they're supposed to be, literally. Mm. You, you ever have any big spiritual uh, experience that convince you there, convinces you there's a God? Mine, my journey, absolutely. Why does that convince you? Because there's, anyone who is sober, statistics state, right, uh, from, from all the... Uh, all the studies that are done, the analytics that are collected, that, that, that I, and this is the cold hard data, this is the facts, the numbers, that I, statistics state, that I am to be high or dead right now. Fact is, 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 is. And that's how you know there's a God? That, uh, that alone. Right. So anybody, Damn, who's so, I, wish, I wish I was convinced of that easily that, but that I, I wasn't for a long time. Right. This isn't like, but I just, mean, that's that, that, but that, if you look at the analytics, the statistics, the, the studies that are done all around the world, it yeah. states that anyone in recovery is to be high or dead right now. And the fact that we're not as a miraculous equaling a miracle and B it defies fucking logic. I know, but some of these addicts like are, are, are fucking, I, 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 I don't know if it's a PC thing, but I'm, not really PC. I just say sure. it bluntly so people can understand what I'm saying. No doubt. But I say like a druggie, which mm -hmm. means addict. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm a druggie mm -hmm. or an addict for 10 years, everybody says, oh, you're going to end up dead. You're going to end up dead. You're going to end up dead. You're saying that the statistics say that if you're an addict for a period Sober. of time, you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Mo the but majority you know, of addicts. Yeah, that, but you know, we're all going to die. Yes. Addict but I'm talking not. about getting sober, not, like not just an addict living life while continuing to drink or drug, like the ones that actually are blessed with sobriety and recovery. Those are supposed to be dead? Yes. Why? Because the way the numbers are, are collected, it states that more people stay caught up in the grips of addiction than are blessed with the ability to find recovery. It just defies the logic of the studies that they're doing. Hmm. Like predominantly the numbers state that, that addicts more so die than get sober as a direct result of their addiction. Very rarely do they find recovery. Well, again, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm relating 
me to you and your your stuff because again i mean to me i'm i wasn't an addict so i can't totally. relate i can't relate but sure i know that by statistically speaking i shouldn't be a multi-millionaire correct statistically speaking mm -hmm. i should be a regular old joe blow yes. blue collar uh, uh brokey yes there's druggies and there's, there's brokies. <laughs> I was supposed to be a brokey. No doubt. So how, it, that doesn't tell me there's a God. It tells me that like, you know, I've been lucky or I've been blessed or. True. You know, so where's now, your certainty? For me, uh, once we get into the work of my program, um, outlined through Alcoholics Anonymous in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, which is like a Bible to the holy goer. Sure. You know, it's, it's our design, our way of life. And in that it talks about that no human power could relieve us of the obsession or lift us of the desire uh, to drink or drug. Only a spiritual higher That's being it. could. Absolutely. That and, may be true. And, and uh, it's proved true for me because there were so many times that I, like you, swore off uh, alcohol or drugs because of the, the issue I created the night before or the people I had harmed or the embarrassment that I felt. The pain was so great that I'm done, I'm done, and I fucking meant it. I meant it. Um, How long was your longest period of success prior to 13? 30 days. So you would have already slipped if you were going to slip. Totally. And, but even in that 30 days, I was still furious that I lost the ability to drink wine. I like wine. Right? <laughs> I drink wine like people drink water. Uh, that's funny. Um, you can't have one glass. No. No. But you know what? Today, I always, I, maybe I could. I'm a listen, I man. always argue, especially when people say they're addicts, that yeah. that's not true. But I don't want to be the reason somebody <laughs> fucking proves me that they can't. <laughs> well, but to me, it's like, damn, dude, if you can go that long and, and, and you're not doing shit, you got to know, dude, I can't have more than one. See, there's there's the trick. Most people say, well, I can't have any because if I have any, I'm fucked. Sure. Well, I don't believe that. Yeah. But again, I'm not, I don't want people falling off the wagon. To me, if you go, I can only have one. Mm -hmm. Drink, can't have another. Mm -hmm. Just like you right now, you can't have one, so you don't have one. Yeah. You think if I have one, I'll have two. No, because not in my mind, because one doesn't fuck you up. I was say, what's the point of one just pisses me off. Well, that's why I don't drink because <laughs> exactly. why? Exactly. So at the end of the day, but, but a wine's different. A, a little glass of vino, a good one, especially, you know, a little glass of wine sip, sip during dinner. No problem. And by the way, I don't even consider that drinking. Yeah. To me. <laughs> That's not drinking. Well, is I it? used to feel the same way you think. That's not drinking. <laughs> That's how I thought for a long time. And the truth be told, I very well could maybe have a glass of wine now. But my history states well, don't and shows do to me that the stakes are far too high. Yeah, don't do it, and, dude. And and now what's happened is I've I've remained sober long enough to be blessed with this really amazing life that the scales of justice have finally equaled out to where it would be complete fucking insanity for me to find a glass of wine appealing. Like my life is so beautiful and full and enriched today. And I always say for me, sobriety has given me everything that drugs and alcohol ever promised me. Well, not only that, dude, you'd be responsible for a lot of people falling off a wagon, even if you were successful, because you're the example for a lot of totally, people. Totally, totally. And it's like, Brandon can have a glass of wine. Well, shit, I, I, I've got hope. Yeah, yeah. And in reality, you cause them to crash because some people, they cannot. Yeah. I and, just know and, it's, and, and, and it's also easier for, for me to stay sober than it is to ever get sober. It's so yeah. hard. You know, it's once you're there. Exactly. It's like if you ever intermittent fast. Yeah. Not, not like I'm not, not, not enough to say. Yeah. So dude, like, <laughs> I wish to, I did more. It's so easy once you do it. Mm. Like, you know, it's hard getting there. Like, until you know, the abnormal becomes the normal yeah like now i'm, I'm intermittent fasting now for 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 a while it's it's killer by the way um, and now it's like why wouldn't you do it to me or you know what i mean like that's your norm now, now. i look forward to it yeah, I, look, yeah. I look forward to waking up a little bit hungry and i look forward to fasting so it's all see that's kind of the same thing as having that spiritual experience a psychic change you look at things you react to things differently right like uh i yeah it's it's my brain for so many years told me, uh, you know, to give up was to, to lose, to give up was to fail, to give up was to die, uh, to fight was to like 
throw in the towel, right? And then I, I come into sobriety and it tells me all the exact opposite. To fight yeah. is to die. To fight is to lose. To fight is to relapse. So it's a complete mind fuck. So understanding that everything that this telling this tells me is generally a lie. And, 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 and the sooner I was able to understand that, then I could start to understand the gravity and severity of the alcoholism or addiction I was up against, right? Talking about that's why I got beat to fuck because I never understood the power and severity of the situation. I never respected it, never gave it the time it was deserved. Finally, through the appropriate amount of pain, because I don't change when shit's unmanageable. Unmanageable, unmanageable to me is like a, a Monday morning cup of tea. I only change when shit's unbearable, right? When my back's against the wall, then you get my attention. I bought in, started to understand uh, about the disease I was diagnosed with and learned like what I need to do in order to ensure long-term recovery or sobriety. It's such a mind fuck because recovery is one of those things that works so well, we stop doing it. Yeah. Right? Because I come in here broken, pain so great, family left me, job fucking fired me, wife divorced me, jobless, penniless, all that shit's gone. I buy into what you suggest I do to get a better life. All of a sudden, I get a lot back in a very short period of time. Things are going great. And now, all those things that I did to acquire everything that I felt like I was missing has caused this really full life. And now those things that were, were needed to be done to get what I lost has now started to become an inconvenience, right? And then I start to walk my way out of the program and then I'm like, ah, I could maybe just have one glass of vino. That's, that's how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But I get it. Ignorance is no longer bliss, right? I sat the fuck down, I shut up and I listened for a, a long enough period of time to, to, to do the worst thing I could have ever done for my, my drinking and drugging career. I acquired some knowledge and now it's really tough to like drink a glass of wine when it's cut with AA. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sit right, man. Yeah, you can't. So, so if there's people listening, normally I'd say, well, there's no, uh, you know, addicts listening. Cause like addicts don't listen to podcasts, but you know, you'd be surprised who might be in a little help or might be in a little trouble right now. You never know. could be your son, could be your husband, For could sure. be your wife, could be people that you had no idea and they're really good at hiding it, but you've have a, you, you know a druggie or an addict. Is, is being called a druggie a, a negative thing? I'm like the, the I don't want to offend the I'm druggies. like the, the hardest person to offend I used to let men blow me for heroin so <laughs> it's gonna take a lot for someone to offend me at this point you know what I mean like Dude, you used to let them yeah, blow you. That's that's, a thing. that's much better. That's a thing. Than, that's, that's much <laughs> if better. We're, if we're weighing the scales of justice here, yeah, like again, it wasn't well, desired. Well, it was, if, if you were doing the blowing to get the heroin, like that makes more sense. Like, why would someone want to blow you so badly? To you know, why? It's a thing. It's a fetish. It's a. It's and it was. It wasn't anything that I pursued. One day, I, right, the desperation met opportunity, and I was propositioned by a gentleman. Uh, who ironically enough in Baltimore there was this corner where I used to skate in the city and, and, and we'd see those boys on that corner and we'd make fun of those boys and uh, cut to years later I had stole this stuff the fence wasn't buying it that day and it was like 10.30 at night the heroin stores are like closing because they don't stay open throughout the night at that time and and, and I'm like really fucking desperate. And all of a sudden this, this car pulls over and he beeps the horn. It's a, it's a Cadillac and guy's got a wedding ring on. He said, hey, uh, how much for the furniture? I had this furniture I was lugging around, this cast iron furniture. I'd started, I'd stole it at like 7 a.m. It's now 10.30 p.m. I'm sick. And, and I said, uh, 150 bucks. And he said, I, I have 150 bucks, but I'm not interested in the furniture. And I, you know, Again, I, I lost the ability to have a say so. But at that but at that point in time, dude, you'll do anything. Anything. N including kill someone, maybe. I was gonna say that was the only thing I never committed in order to acquire heroin. And it's not because I wasn't cut from that cloth. It was simply because like the opportunity never presented itself when I was sick enough or in that amount of pain. Mm. Like that's thankfully. Because now you could be in prison sober. Literally, yeah. And that's that wouldn't that be a fucked up thing, dude? Get so bad where you wake up in prison sober? And by the way, most people think you go to prison, you have to be sober. Not true. No. There's drugs in there too. Totally. So, so if there's someone listening and needs a little help, you, you mentioned that, you know, you help people whether they have money or not. Yeah. I imagine you do some 
some philanthropic stuff where you have all kinds of people that donate and help financially. Mm -hmm. If people are listening, they, they, they hear you, they have had relatives, they want to donate and support you. How do they do that? So there's a Venmo. It's, it's simply at Novak's house. Real simple. Um, N O V A A K S S H O U S E at Novak's house. If you're out there and you're like, Hey man, I want to support this guy. Five bucks, 50 cents, a dollar, $10. Literally. Uh, it goes so, so far. It, It really does. But, um, but that's if they want to support, what if they need you? In other words, they don't have help, any money, but sure. they know somebody that needs a bed or needs not even a bed help. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you said, the beds come after the help. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you have to go to an inpatient form of care to be detoxed or whatever your situation can is. Can you help people find those? Yeah. So you can call me and my team directly at 610-314-6747. And Damn. you will get me or my other employee, John, on the phone. And we will walk you through this process. Don't get mad. This is a very big platform that I'm giving this number on. So if we don't answer immediately, remember there's two of us and we're doing the best that we can humanly possible. Um, but but we will, and, and I have devoted my life in, in doing that, the sober living homes. And then that gave birth to, uh, I knew that I could do more and, and I could be better at helping a lot. And I created Redemption Addiction Treatment Center. And that's just kind of like the house is on steroids, if you will. <laughs> and they're 13 minutes apart from each other. So it's. Dude, we're going to from both sides. Yeah. Kind of like good. Big Pharma did. <laughs> yeah, in well, a positive again, way. Dude, you might end up, you know, worth a billion dollars too, because there's big money in treatment centers. Mm-hmm. I have a buddy that basically was an addict, mm-hmm. started a, a treatment home or whatever, mm-hmm. treatment facility. And, and, and eventually sold them for a hundred plus million. Mm-hmm. And he's like freaking now he, he still helps, but like he do, he, he made a hundred million I know who dollars. I you're talking about. I think he's probably a friend of mine. He, you can say his name. Eric. Right? Yeah. Eric. That's Spoffer. my guy. Yeah. Yeah. Like dude, like that's a, a dear kill- friend of mine. So that's his a killer story though. His, like dude, yeah. you're, a, you're an addict. Then you go to just help. You're just looking to help. And all of a sudden you realize, dude, there's hundreds of millions of dollars helping. Shout out Eric. Yeah. Granite recovery. He sold. That's a dear friend of mine. He, my mentor and my business partner in redemption is him. Those two are very close. Massachusetts boys. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's a, a very big, small world. And, and uh, I, I talk to Eric and get guidance from him. He is one of those people you said, how do you know? Like he's one of those mentors in my life as well. And you also, and you also hear outside of the uh, addiction industry, if you will, even entrepreneurial space, you know, mm-hmm. Hey, you know, you, you got to help others. That's how you, that's how you help yourself. It's, it's always like, it, that's the same there as it is here yeah. as it is there as it is there. It's like, dude, it's crazy. You, like you said, it's like opposite. Like, for example, if you're looking for comfort, seek discomfort. Yeah. If you're looking uh, uh, to be uncomfortable, well, then seek comfort. Totally. Because that's where you end up. Yeah. It's almost like this backwards thing. You want this, well, then you got to do this. If you want more, you got to give, give more. more. Well, how does that freaking equal? Ooh, but it I does. Just, I just talked about that. Anywhere else in the world, in any form of business, if I give you something that I have, I am to walk away with less. Absolute fact. But in this world of ours, and, and what you were just saying, if I give you something that I have, I walk away with more. And now looking back at all those, you know, sleepless nights that I spent, on the streets and, and prostituting my body and eating out of trash cans and, you know, really taking really bad things. What I thought were just like victim mentality, like poor me, poor me. The reality is a, why the fuck not me? But B, all I was doing was being divinely inconvenienced, Mm. right? Where God was just allowing me to have some repercussions for my actions and generally creating just a big enough gap between me and the last, needle I stuck in my arm, pill I put down my throat or bottle to my mouth to have that moment of clarity to see what my life really looked like was. Mm. And, uh, and those were the, the seeds that were being planted along the way that I didn't see at the time. I was so consumed by the mess that I was incapable of seeing the fucking message until, you know, opportunity, timing, maturity, age, the stars, the people, everything aligned. And on May 25th, you know, the skies parted and I like walked across the sea and it was very easy for me to see like 
the reality of my situation, A, but B, more importantly, what it was going to take for me to get out of the position I had created for myself. And that was during addiction. So I was taking accountability for my actions, which is not what addicts do. I was doing like at the end on my way to that treatment center, I knew shit was changing. But I also knew that I was the boy that cried wolf a lot of times before because I genuinely believed what I was saying. Mm. So I knew how, I knew it was best for me to just shut the fuck up. And, and what I did was, again, getting all these pieces of information prior. They told me it wasn't the drugs that was the problem. It wasn't the drinking. It's the thinking. It's the behavior. It's the attitude. So this very last attempt at treatment, I did something I'd never done before. I shut the fuck up. I stopped calling with these, with these grand illusions, how things were going to change and I'm going to be the son, the husband, the, the employer you've been waiting for. And, and I just shut up and, and I, I didn't talk. What I did was I walked and I let my walk do my talk and people started noticing the change in my behavior. And therefore people started reaching out to me. I didn't have to go sell this to them. That's what I did so long. My, my, my first book that did insanely well was called Dream Seller. That's what I did. I sold dreams. I had to make you believe the unbelievable. In order so you're to good see. at sales. Do you think it's worse now or before with the opioid versus the fentanyl? Oh, it's way worse. So way, fentanyl, way worse. And again, I mean, fentanyl kills, period. Legit. Quickly. Yeah. Sometimes touching it. You'd always how, hear how, you die, but now you're like, you'll die. I know, but like, that's what I don't understand. Like, how is fentanyl, don't these people understand you'll die? And how are they not dying then if everyone's taking it? Well, you have to understand that, that at that point when we're consumed in our addiction, the abnormals become the normal. I know, but if you if it's so deadly and you then do you, it, you'll die. There'd be nobody doing it because everyone's dead. Is what your brain says because you're connected to reality. What my brain tells me when I'm consumed with addiction is somebody died, where is it at? It's got to be fucking potent. I need that. Wow. Even if I, even if they'll die. So that's the first thought. The second thought, the harm reduction, which a lot of addicts are doing right now, is they're getting high in pairs of two, and they carry, uh, they carry uh, Narcan on them. Which brings so you back you, or something. So me and you, we'll go cop dope. We'll go shoot it, sniff it. However we do it, you go first, and I have Narcan just in case you go out. And then once you're good, I go and you have the, you know what I mean? But that's what brings you back on that shit? Yeah, it reverses the effects of opioids. Oh, it's crazy. It's, but again, if we look at the demographic, if we look at the statistics, the analytics that are being collected from all of these surveys throughout the world, it says that we're fighting an unwinning battle, Mm. which it very well might look like that. But ask my mother, she'll tell you different. Because I'm not buried in that plot that she bought me nine years ago on Mother's Day. Oh, I effects. still have it for sale. Yeah, dude, wants one, to buy that even, plot. even one life, to your point, is winning. All you know, perspective. You don't, it doesn't. You don't have to save everybody if you can save a few. Mm-hmm. That's this, awesome. This one turned into two, two to four, four to eight, eight to sixteen, and then you turn into the the Eric Spofforts, the Matt Gannams, my partners, who who then start purchasing real estate everywhere and creating these you know businesses and inspiring people like me. Those guys inspired me, and I'm on the same journey that they were on. I'm, I'm following in their footsteps. They're still on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, everybody's on a journey till they're not. Totally. Yeah, well, I'm glad uh, shit worked out for you. Uh, you know, maybe we need to go figure out how to intervene with Bam. Yeah, well, uh, he's doing great right now. Oh, is he good? Yeah, he's, he's uh, from what I see on social media, he's killing it. Good. So so I, I, he, I'm really grateful for him. I'm, I'll never not be grateful. If it wasn't for him extending that opportunity to move in with him at Westchester and to his big fucking castle Ape house. And, and, and Phil and all what, them. Yeah, what, what's uh, the mom's name? Ape. Oh, Ape. Ape That's and mom. Phil. And, and if he didn't extend that opportunity to me, I, I firmly believe I'd be in that plot that my mother bought me. No yeah. doubt. Um, and he never gave up on me. He'd, get, he'd kick me out when I'd get high. He'd kick me out. I'd go back to Baltimore, figure it out, ask him if I could come back, wash, rinse, repeat. But like, you know. He wasn't on anything then. He just, a normal guy. He could drink, you know, blow some Adderall. And it was, it was a party for him then too. <laughs> until it no longer became a party. Huh. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad everything's working out, folks. Um, if you want to help support, like I said, 
go help yeah. support at Novak's House of Venmo. You can find his website, brandonnovak.com. You, a lot of you guys already know who he is, so you follow him on social media. But if you're not and you want to, at Brandon underscore Novak, go pick up his book, Dream Seller, and freaking share this because, again, you never know who's who's an addict that you wouldn't even know about because they're keeping it that undercover. Legit. Appreciate you coming in. Hey, thanks for the talk, man. Folks, as always, till next time, keep it real. Then they need repetition. Most people aren't making their people go through the training more often and enough. So there's no repetition. Well, you have to have repetition. So good content, repetition. Then you need practice. Most of these companies aren't allowing for